my love story with Taiwan started when I was 20, which is quite uh, an early age, but I'm very happy to say that because I'm still very young. In five years, uh, my research on Taiwan will have lasted uh, already half of my life. <laughs> and after five years, every year that will pass, will add one more year. And, uh, and soon it will be maybe three third, uh, two thirds and three thirds of my life. So I went uh, to Taiwan for the first time when I was 20. That was in 1992, if I remember correctly. And uh, that was my first discovery, soon followed by my first research when I was a master's student at Sciences Po in Paris. And um, <clears throat> my advisor asked me why I was interested by Taiwan. And my reply was that because Taiwan seems to have a very interesting question of national identity. So that was in 1993 when I was back. And at that time, if you remember, Taiwan was uh, uh, under the Li Tanghui presidency. The um, uh, temporary provisions had been lifted two years before, and uh, Taiwan was democratizing at a fast pace, but was still far behind what it came, became later and what it is now. And um, I did not know a lot about Taiwan at that time, but then I was not wrong. There was really a real question of national identity. Not many, many persons would say it abroad at that time. The period of the Kuomintang uh, control of Taiwan was not over. And though everything was changing, the question of identity was still very, very sensitive at that time. And then during the 90s, two movements that I witnessed when I moved to Taiwan in 1994 developed together, which are very interesting in Taiwan's political development experience, which are democratization and the public discussion of national identity. And the two movements are really very closely linked to each other. Without the national identity question, the democratization in Taiwan wouldn't have probably developed at such a fast pace. But without the democratization of Taiwan, the national identity question wouldn't have been discussed uh, that quickly and that uh, extensively. So the combination of these two movements is very interesting in Taiwan's experience. Now how do I situate and position my research in this field? When I arrived in Taiwan in 1994, one of my first, one of the first friends I, I met, I made there, was a second generation mainlander. And he was a very nice person, except that from the political point of view, he was kind of radical. <laughs> a radical that many, uh, that had political opinions that many mainlanders in Taiwan now would not even have. And um, from his, uh, point of view, I quickly understood that the mainlanders were feeling a kind of identity crisis in Taiwan. And I was very young at the time, I was 23 or 24, I had hardly uh, registered in the PhD program uh, at Sciences Po in Paris, so I did not know much. But I knew that the mainlanders were a minority and that the mainlanders had moved to Taiwan uh, in 1949, in the uh, psychological conditions we know, I had in fact already written an MA thesis on Taiwan under Chiang Kai-shek, so I had read pretty much uh, many books about Taiwan. But that's perhaps the reason why I decided to concentrate immediately on this issue, because in a way I felt very clearly that that was the core issue. And I think that still today, in 2006, it's still a very central issue. A long time has passed ever since I got my MA thesis, my PhD thesis. I wrote two books, including one in Chinese. But in recent years, especially before the 2004 presidential elections, many scholars abroad, I mean by abroad, outside of Taiwan or America or France, uh, outside of Taiwan, meaning in America or France or Europe. Many scholars in recent years started to tell me, Stefan, 
you are still talking about a mainlanders, but um, you know the ethnic issues in Taiwan are less and less important. And I never agreed with that. Uh, first, I've never said that the main dividing issue in Taiwan is between mainlanders and Taiwanese. That's, f of course, really um, exaggerated. Second, this division, if it's not the most important one, still very deeply impacts the other divisions, namely not unification versus independence, not um, being Taiwanese against being mainlanders or being Taiwanese against being Chinese. This main dividing line being having a strong Chinese consciousness or having a strong Taiwanese consciousness. And I add strong this word because you can be both at the same time, like having a Chinese consciousness and a Taiwanese consciousness at the same time. But the main division line is between those who have a strong feeling of being Chinese and those who have a strong be feeling of being Taiwanese. And this is a distinct um, dividing line, distinct from the notion of being pro-independence or pro-unification. It is closely linked to the perception of Taiwan as a nation or as a specific part of a greater Chinese ensemble. But um, what is sure is that it is a very useful dividing line to oppose it, to oppose Chineseness and Taiwaneseness or Chinese consciousness, Zhongguo Yi Shi, and Taiwaneseness, Taiwan Yi Shi. Why? Because it's a very elaborate division in the sense that you can have a strong Chineseness, but still feel sympathetic to Taiwan's independence. Or the opposite, feeling a strong uh, Taiwaneseness, but not being in favor of Taiwan independence. Um, so that's a more, a more useful division or operating tool than to oppose Wai Xiangren and Ben Xiangren mainlanders and native Taiwanese. And so I think this division is still very important today. I think nobody would uh, deny it, considering what is happening in Taiwan since the last presidential election. But before discussing that, perhaps we could go back to the uh, period when Li Tonghui was president, try to analyze it, see what happened at that time, and what has changed ever since, and what are the differences between the um, mentality of people, both mainlanders and Taiwanese, in Taiwan during that period and now. It happens that my, my PhD research was entirely devoted to this, this very precise topic. What do the mainlanders feel in Taiwan under the literary era about the questions of nationhood, Taiwanese identity, Taiwanese unification or independence and their status, position and feelings within and towards the Taiwanese society. That survey was made uh, under Li Tanghui, so it was not made afterwards and asking them to think and express what they thought at that time. So the study was um, conducted in 97 um, and I wrote a book in Chinese about this called Feng He Nuan, Light Wind and Warm Sun. And the conclusions of this study and the conclusion of the book shows that during the literary period there was an undeniable Taiwanization movement of the mainlanders. Um, of course, many people would deny it now, and even then, Many people would deny that they had become Taiwanese. However, um, after making clusters and grouping individuals into different categories from the most uh, conservative regarding national unification or Taiwanese independence and Taiwan's uh, identity to the most inclined to understand or appreciate what we would call today a green point of view about Taiwanese identity and future. After classifying those people into different opinion groups, I realized that even the most pro-unification people 
had become Taiwanese already. And this argument um, pleased the mainlanders in Taiwan very much when I published this book. But there were other arguments that made them more angry or less satisfied about my book. The same happened for the Green Camp, satisfied with a few arguments and dissatisfied with others, which is perhaps um, an indication that the book was not that bad. <laughs> um, so many people did deny it, that they had become um, Taiwanese already or partially Taiwanese. But then it was very obvious um, uh, through uh, the answers they made about uh, different questions related to those core issues of Taiwanese nationhood, etc. And to get a sense of plurality in their opinion, I asked the same question different ways and I analyzed the differences between different answers to what was basically the same question but ask, asked from another point of view. And um, that was a pretty clear uh, indication of what was happening in Taiwan at that time. What is interesting is now to define what would be this Taiwanization movement. The so-called Taiwanization movement was a way, was a feeling of really belonging to this land, having rooted down and feeling part of the Taiwanese community of faith. Even starting learning Taiwanese for some and even at the end of the 90s uh, being quite pleased to show that they were able, able to use a few Taiwanese words in their uh, discourse. But that was, that stopped short uh, to feeling part of a Taiwanese nation. I said feeling part of a Taiwanese community of faith. Yes, probably for many of them, but not of a Taiwanese nation. And that is the bottom line and the real difference. Taiwanese, Taiwanization of the mainlander really means that they started to feel belonging to this land but not supporting independence for most of them or not considering Taiwan as being anything else that at most a specific part of Chinese culture with a specific history and very probably a pluralistic identity but just as other parts of China with a very complex local identity. So that was very clear, both their Taiwanization and that this feeling of being Taiwanese was different from the feeling of being Taiwanese by the native Taiwanese. Saying this in very simple words takes us back to the root of the problem today. I think it has been expressed in this sentence. And this has changed a lot uh, now. Because when Li Tongwei was president, nobody would expect that the Greens would come to power. That was still at the time, I recall very precisely, I was living at that time, that was still like a theoretical option that nobody would really think about seriously. Of course, except for the militants of the Green Camp, who would really long for that and desire for that very uh, deeply and by every political observer in the months before the 2000 um, presidential election when it became technically possible that the Green Camp would win. But apart from this period, during the 90s nobody in Taiwan, especially among the mainlanders, would expect the uh, transition of power for 2000. And if you remember, Li Tengui put a lot of efforts um, in helping um, Lian Zhan to be elected, even though some people say that, well, his efforts were ambiguous and that he played uh, for the Green Camp at the same time. I'm not sure that it's really true, but whatever. And so the mainlanders were feeling that they had no other possibility than identifying to this land. Though at the same time, most of them had a bad opinion of Li Tangwei, and part of them really 
hated Li Tongwei to an extent that has never been met uh, or has rarely been met in Western democracies, except perhaps today in America for people who haven't voted for George Bush and are very uh, unhappy with his being president of the United States. But this is important to say because it shows why things have changed uh, during the, uh, with the 2004 um, presidential um, election and the transfer of power. Because what happened, no, not 2004, sorry, with the 2000 power transfer, because what happened was precisely what was unbelievable. The situation that I have just described during the late 90s has deeply changed now. And this change uh, happened uh, with the um, 2000 presidential election and the power transfer. And it was increased um, or deepened by the uh, following presidential election, the contested 2004 election, and especially deepened in recent months with the uh, financial scandals that are developing in Taiwan now. What happened in 2000 was that the mainlanders witnessed uh, what had appeared during the 90s as precisely the unbelievable. A pro-independence, Taiwan-born president of the DPP becoming the president of what the ROC, the Republic of China. So, what we had witnessed before, this Taiwanization movement, making people like me and others saying that, well, it's game over for the Fei Zhu Liu Pai, the non-mainstream faction, meaning the anti-Li um, uh, clan within the KMT party. Those people had stopped to voice their opposition already. And this is what changed. The mainlanders, after the 2000 presidential election, started to voice their opposition again. That was the first step. But there remained quite um, quiet <laughs> uh, in comparison to their um, attitude now, even though in the first mandate uh, presidency of Chen Shui-bian, they really um, expressed strong opposition already and developed a lot of political strategies and strength and influence to prevent the president to um, um, do what he um, wanted to do. I would just quote two little examples. The first one was the um, use of the nuclear power plant um, pretext to ask uh, for the first time the president to resign or even more precisely to force him to resign by trying to impeach him. I would like to comment uh, here that in terms of constitutional analysis everyone in the West knows that impeaching a president cannot be known in a dual executive system such as Taiwan's or France's system for a political reason, because a president is elected to, to, to implement his political goals and he can be impeached only in case of high treason, meaning endangering the sovereignty of the nation by um, discussing with, an, with the enemy or compromising on the nation's sovereignty. And this should be the only reason why you impeach a president and not because you disagree with his politics and policies. Another case would be if he has breached the constitutional order and did something which is, which is against the constitution, which did not happen. That is the first example. And the second example I would take is about the uh, Ren Shi Taiwan, Knowing Taiwan textbook affair. Um, if you remember, in 1997, when Li Teguo was still president, the uh, Minister of Education under the Kuomintang Party uh, decided, uh, and especially the Taiwan, the Taiwan faction within the party, obtained uh, from the Minister of Education 
that uh, an educational reform was launched starting in 1994 and the outcome was that in 1997 the ministry adopted a new series of textbooks at the junior high level called Knowing Taiwan and that had been adopted within a uh, fierce political battle between what we call now the Greens and the Blues um, over the, the issue. Finally, the pro-reform camp uh, won and this first program putting an emphasis on Taiwanese history and society was adopted. And I really thought at the time that it had been a hard uh, fought battle won by the progressive camp, the Taiwan faction, and that probably it would be unthinkable and impossible for the, for the Blues to overcome it. And when the Green came into power, then I thought, okay, that's going probably to go on. And what happened was absolutely surprising. In 2001 or 2002, uh, through its legislative majority, the Blue Camp obtained from the ministry that they abandoned this reform that had been applied since three years already at the time. Which is a clear indication that even under the first presidency of Chen Shui-bian, the Blues have never abandoned their efforts to counteract uh, and to counter the president and the Green Camp on the so-called Taiwanization of Taiwan or the promotion of a Taiwanese point of view. However, there were two examples to show that they, are still, they still voiced strong opposition, but that was nothing compared to what happened later on. I think there is a big difference between Chen Shui-bian's first presidency and Chen Shui-bian's second presidency, which means that between Li Tanghui's Li Tanghui, Li Tanghui, presidency, between 96 and 2000, Chen's first term and Chen's second term, there is a gradual um, ev um, evolution of the mainlander um, positioning, the positioning of mainlander political elite regarding this um, issue of Taiwanese consciousness and Taiwanese identity. They started again to voice their opposition, as I said, after 2000, but then the uh, political um, earthquake of 2004 happened and everybody knows um, the different contending opinions about what happened, the uh, assassination attempt and the um, contested electoral results. I'm certainly not going to uh, voice uh, any, to, to say any uh, comment on these two issues, um, but what I just want to say here is that the way the Blues have interpreted both events, the assassination attempt and the um, de debated uh, result, um, provoked a, a deep feeling of um, having been cheated um, and a feeling of insecurity um, in Taiwan. They have been, many of them have been convinced that they have been deprived of their um, legitimate victory and tur things turned out very, very bad after that. The Greens, in response, interpreted the Blues move as uh, one more attempt to prevent the Green Taiwanese to rule Taiwan and that that was really enough for them. So things really started to be ugly after 2004 and the um, pace of accusation of mutual, of the two camps, mutual accusations um, became really nasty, especially after uh, May, April and May 2006 when uh, Chiu Yi came up with this um, question of the corruption of these president's son-in-law and that everybody started to uh, um, position it himself or herself uh, about whether the President Chen should stay in power or not. That is what has changed since the Li Tanghui area because it's hard to see now any mainlander doing what they did at the time, taking pride into 
using Taiwanese language and acknowledging that they are both Chinese and Taiwanese. We nowadays hear many mainlanders in Taiwan say again, I'm Chinese, 我是中国人, full stop. I'm Chinese and nothing else. And this is not new because it was the, what they would say for decades before the, the 90s. But there was this moment when we could imagine that despite political feuds and crises and ambiguities, both camps would compromise the green and not being too um, radical uh, on the independence issue and the blues being eager to acknowledge that well it might be um, a pity but Taiwan and China have been separated for such a long time our political systems are so different we definitely belong to a distinct political entity and unification with China would be done at the expense of our freedom and um, our style and level of life. We could hope that at that time the two comes would mm, agree to work together at least to um, perhaps not found a new nation, certainly not, but at least belong to a common um, people as long as, it, as long as it was not called a nation. But this is over now. Everybody will feel when you're blue that talking about a Taiwanese people means talking about Taiwanese uh, identity and Taiwanese independence. And everyone in the green camp would feel that when you claim that you are Chinese, um, you still favor unification. Whereas China is menace, menacing Taiwan, both politically and militarily. And uh, that is why the discussion has become nasty now. And I was reading recently some stuff about the uh, Tibetan um, movement in exile. And in recent months, I have discussed many times with uh, Tibetan experts and experts of the Tibetan question, and also Tibetans in exile and French militants um, for the Tibetans. And I saw some common points. Um, uh, between Taiwan and, the t and Tibet regarding the uh, issue of identity, who we are in front of uh, uh, omnipotent China, uh, o an overpowerful China, which in the case of Tibet controls Tibet and in the case of Taiwan wants to control Taiwan and currently um, influences its destinies by playing a big role in the game, um, influencing Taiwan's domestic politics. What is the common point between the two? Um, there is an ongoing debate in Tibetan circles, Tibetan independence militant circles, on what is the attitude to be followed uh, in dealing with China. Two schools, very simply. One is saying that China is the invader, menacing Tibetan culture, um, being guilty of uh, perpetrating a cultural genocide, if not an ethnic genocide in, in Tibet. And that isn't, there is no way to discuss with China. Uh, because anyway, she will win in the, in, the, in the end, and that her attitude is absolutely disgusting. And the other school of thought, the one which is, um, seems to be the, the, the followed by the Dalai Lama, is to find a way to engage China, to make compromises, and to refrain absolutely from having any anti-Chinese behavior. But you see, this is very, very common, very um, similar to what happens some of the discussions within the blue camp and how to deal with the notion of mainlander identity, mainlander power and influence in Taiwan and Chinese attitude towards Taiwan. One school in the green says that considering what happened in the last 40 years and considering the um, ambiguities, what they call the ambiguities of the blues, to um, become part of the Taiwanese um, 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 nation, the reluctance that they have to become part of it, um, and considering their um, their um, 
strategies now to do whatever is possible to obtain the departure of the president and having preventing preventing the government the green government to to rule and apply to do what they wanted to do um, for six years through the blues uh, legislative majority the green say well there is no way to discuss with these people because whatever we do anyway they will op oppose it but of course as we all, we, we all know not everyone agree in the bl green camp regarding this strategy there are still many people saying that well, we should try a, f a way, uh, find a way to um, discuss with the with the blues and um, be more sensitive to their position, uh, understand their point of view, and try to work together with them um, to find something that is in the interest of Taiwan and seeing that our common enemy anyway is China and not the mainlanders. But of course. Other people in the green camp reply to this, this is a naive attitude because whatever happens, the mainlanders will anyway oppose uh, our policies and that their only, ga only aim is to recover power in Taiwan. And I have to say that unfortunately, um, this latter argument uh, finds some illustrations in Taiwan. Um, for instance, when Ma Ying-chou was elected uh, to the Taipei mayor mayorship in 1998, there were people who said in Chinese this incredible sentence, We have at last recovered Taipei. But anyone understanding Chinese know, knows what Guangfu means. Guangfu was the word used by the Nationalist Party to describe the so-called 1945 five retrocession of Taiwan to China and Guangfu in this case means we are reinstated in our legitimate position of the ruler of Taiwan in the first case Taipei in the second and this mentality shows in the word of some green theoreticians and militants that the mainland in Taiwan have a colonialist point of view on Taiwan thinking that they are the legitimate rulers of Taiwan, even though they are a, a minority coming from abroad, and even though their regime has deeply Taiwanized in Taiwan, and is certainly not anymore what it was 60 years ago when it moved to Taiwan. And for this reason, I think the mainlanders should do their best to understand the logic and legitimacy of the Taiwanese uh, population just as if anybody want if we want to make some progress into ethnic understanding in Taiwan just as the greens also must be sensitive to the blues sensitivity but we should never forget one thing is that Taiwan whether you like it or not is already independent from China has a different political regime and that the mainlanders are a, mi a minority it doesn't mean that the majority rules all the time and should dictate its policy to the minority. But the fact is that the mainlanders are a minority and if they are, are Taiwanized, they still have way too much compassion for a regime in China that is threatening Taiwan's liberties by asking for a unification with a regime that is not democratic and in this way we should we should say that well at least in my position it's I hope it's not biased even though it is very uh, subjective in this way when I hear both sides arguments against the other side I really personally personally find the green camps argument more acceptable because Whenever they want to say something regarding Taiwanese identity, Taiwanese nation, Taiwan's future, the place of Taiwanese culture in Taiwan, they are always opposed by a minority that still reflect the um, past political socialization. If only the mainlanders could free themselves 
from the socialization of the past, what they learned at school, in the media, and so on, they would probably be more at ease with the notion of Taiwan identity, which is perhaps not a deep tendency of history or something that cannot, uh, that is only the only way to uh, mm, survive in Taiwan or feel Taiwanese. But it's the deep trend, it's, it's the Julio, it's the main train. I mean, because simply numerically speaking, Taiwanese are the majority and they are in an island called Taiwan, which is an island, a specific part, which is not a province uh, like Sichuan or Hubei, which is on the mainland among other Chinese uh, regions or provinces. This is a basic historical, cultural, linguistic, geopolitical and even geographical fact that the mainlanders refuse to acknowledge. But they would say, they would reply to this, we don't refuse to acknowledge it, we absolutely accept it, we even feel we are part of this country, but the Taiwanese do not want us to be part of it. This argument is very interesting, and I can feel that many mainlanders feel miserable because of that. At the same time, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, build the argument like I've heard so many times between Taiwanese and mainlanders, at the same time, the Taiwanese would reply to this, we do let, give you a, 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 a room in this Taiwanese nation. We do appeal, we do call you um, um, on, ask you to be a member of it, members of it. The, the problem is that you are willing to be part of it as long as it, is, as it is not considered a nation. And that is exactly why the mainlanders opposed Li Tengue's theory of Xin Taiwan Ren in the 90s, which happens to be the most elaborate proposition ever done in Taiwan for conflict harmony. But then the mainlanders really opposed it because it means for them being part of a nation and they refuse to consider in Taiwan a nation. And I think that the question of the nation in Taiwan, where is the nation, where does it start and where does it lay, is the core question and all the other derived from it. Um, economic arguments, geopolitical arguments and domestic political arguments, in fact, all revolve around this issue that we don't discuss because it's too sensitive. Is Taiwan a nation or not? To conclude, I would say that in the 90s and early uh, 2000, I, I was quite um, optimistic and even fascinated by what was invented in Taiwan, that kind of laboratory of identities, trying to find a, a way to be together and avoid political turmoil and ethnic feuds. And as you probably understood from what I said earlier, I'm not that pessim optimistic right now, and I would even say that I turned quite pessimistic because in recent years after completing my PhD research and under the uh, Chen Shui-bian administration I kept on asking questions to as many uh, common people I could much less to politicians but common people of every side blue or green um, and what I find is that Apparently everybody lives very well together in Taiwan, not talking about political issues and having neighbors of the other ethnic group and everything goes quite well. But everything goes quite well because we don't talk politics. It doesn't mean that, that politics are not within every people's mind. And what makes me pessimistic is that I'm now definitely convinced that the political opposition derived from a different world view and a different memory of a common past that this diverging opinion is far more important in the Taiwanese psyche and Taiwanese politics which means in the geopolitics of the Taiwan Straits that what many people say and I think deeply that Taiwanese and mainlanders cannot understand each other they can talk to each other, they can intellectually, rationally find a way to dialogue and to build something together. 
But emotionally speaking, there is no way to understand each other. Even though ethnic marriages have since two or three decades eased the problem, it's surging again. And of course it has a geopolitical, geopolitical impact. Some people are wondering whether China will attack Taiwan or not. Personally, I don't think so, for many reasons. I could give two of you, two, two of them to you. The first is that if China wanted to attack Taiwan, then why, Ta why China hasn't done it already? Because as the time is passing, it's going to be even more difficult since Taiwan is more and more mediatized abroad and that more and more people know that Taiwan is a sovereign country. The second reason is that China will not need to attack Taiwan if the current political situation goes on and if Taiwanese and mainlanders are really unable to talk to each other then Taiwanese democracy is threatened and the global response from the Taiwanese society as a whole to the Chinese pressure will weaken further. It's already very weak, extremely weak and it will go on weakening and this will lead Taiwan to fall by itself not without Chinese intervention only the uh, ongoing pressure and the power of attraction that is um, produced by a rising China on those who are looking uh, to China today in Taiwan. And in a way it reminds me uh, with the way the uh, Manchu regime in 1683 uh, finally got Taiwan. When China, for the first time ever, um, obtained Taiwan and claimed sovereignty on it the following year in 1684, in April 1684, when the uh, Manchu Emperor integrated Taiwan into the Qing em um, Emperor, uh, Empire. We often say that China has tried several times, a dozen of times, to invade and attack Taiwan um, before it finally succeeded in 1683. What happened in 1683 was extremely similar to what is happening now in Taiwan. Shi Long led his um, fleet to Taiwan but stayed in the Penghu archipelago. And at the first sight of the Manchu fleet, the Zheng regime, uh, led by the very young Zheng Keshuang, Zheng Chengkong's um, um, uh, gr grandson immediately surrendered without even trying to oppose the Chinese threat. Why? Because the regime was divided, weakened, because the ruler was weak, he was too young, because the regime was corrupted and that the last um, um, civil servants and uh, rulers um, around Zheng Keshuang had taken the opportunity of their position to enrich themselves uh, and instead of developing what uh, Zheng Zhengkong and especially his son Zheng Qing had done, turning Taiwan into a power, uh, powerful economy. And then the regime um, scrambled um, um, and immediately surrendered to the Qing dynasty. I'm afraid that this might happen much more likely than a war in the Taiwan Strait, making China reaching his goal, its goal without even having to fire one of its nu numerous um, uh, missiles. So what I'm afraid is that uh, China will not even have to fire one of its numerous um, uh, missiles and that um, if the Taiwanese and mainlanders go on um, uh, fighting uh, over Taiwanese identity and uh, if the degree of mistrust uh, goes on developing this way, the regime will crumble on itself um, and offering China um, a very simple victory. I'm not even, I'm not sure that a, the um, 
uh, a war in the Taiwan Strait is likely, but it's much more likely that if the problem is solved, it will be solved in this way.